Hi, everybody, and thanks for the invitation to speak. Um, I'm a physician working in central Johannesburg, um, intimately involved in um, the introduction of dolutegravir into South Africa and Southern Africa, um, be involved in clinical research studies as well as operational studies, and that raffia-looking thing is the chemical structure of dolutegravir. Um, and that's what we're going to be talking about, is the rapid introduction of dolutegravir into programs um, and replacing efavirenz across um, large amounts of the globe um, in uh, first line, second line, and third line antiretroviral therapy. These are my various disclosures, um, including um, being the, uh, the PI on advance, one of the large studies done looking at the use of dolutegravir in first line therapy. So where are we here in 2021? As dolutegravir has advanced since 2018, 2019 in WHO guidelines. Well, tenofovir um, does a proxyl fumarate and occasionally TAF in a few countries such as Ambien Botswana. Um, Remivudine and dolutegravir has pretty much become the standard first-line therapy in low middle income countries. In some countries, like in South Africa, about 20% of the patients are still on new favorance based regimens, but that's rapidly changing. The transition period is, is slowly while they, they take care of their stocks, but the future is TLD, you know, that combination I just mentioned. Um, and that and the variations of that actually in the rich world, where Bictegravir is the preferred dolutegravir replacement and TAF is more favored over Tenofovir. So the variation is actually re remarkable that that, uh, that integrase inhibitor combination is what's been used across the globe. Um, and because of the resistance barrier, there's actually almost no second line therapy um, being experienced. There's the first line failures um, are so few and far between that we're just not seeing second line. Um, I think we don't appreciate how little toxicity um, on the first line we're seeing either um, compared to the first line toxicity we saw in the favorite based regimen. So that's, even with tenofovir, the renal toxicity is far, far lower than what we predicted perhaps 10 years ago. There are cases of renal toxicity, but it's very, very low. And the dolutegravir toxicity, certainly um, the, the switches we're seeing are, are very, very small. Um, and I put this so far because we all thought D4T was this one, the drug until the toxicity actually declared itself. But we've got a fair amount of experience now with dolutegravir and its toxicity profile is exceptional. In some ways, the resistance profile is also astonishing. As I said, there's almost no one that has failed dolutegravir because of resistance and perhaps eventually we will fail it. And there have been these isolated instances, but so far from a public health perspective, um, we've had no necessity for second line failure. All we've had is the patients who have failed have been required um, an intensified adherence intervention. And what we've also seen is a steady introduction of TLD into second and third line um, um, regimens where they've replaced those regimens to in complicated ways. And with um, studies such as ARIA and ARTIST, we becoming steadily more confident in the way that we're able to replace those um, move patients on protease inhibitor-based regimens steadily in different ways um, onto these TLD-based regimens. So TLD is essentially taking over the world in one form or another. Um, and steadily, these, these older regimens, these thymidine-based regimens, these regimens with protease inhibitors, these classes of drugs are steadily becoming more, um, you know, more likely to become extinct. So this is a wonderful situation because our antiretroviral regimens are becoming simpler and, you know, both from a supply line, but also from an understanding of toxicities line. And we've actually reduced the debate around first line, second line, third line regimens at the moment around whether we can get rid of tenofovir. Can we just go to 3TC and dolutegravir? And certainly in my part of the world, the issues are around, you know, is can we get rid of tenofovir because we get the free added benefit of treating hepatitis B. And that's kind of the, the swelling debate that we have. So it's quite an embarrassment of riches that we're seeing in the antiretroviral world at the moment. So what's the lessons of Dolly And the first lesson I, I was thinking about how to stretch this lesson. The first is, you know, a new kid on the block may come. And I was, and I was thinking, you know, a couple of years ago in 2012, I was sitting back when I was in the thick of introducing um, of introducing, we just won the debate around the favorins and we harmonized everything. Um, and we were sitting back and appreciating the fact that finally we'd harmonized um, first line therapy. And, and it was amazing at that towards the end of the decade that we'd got tenofovir, 
the movie of the NFR runs all together. And, you know, we had finally, we had made our peace with the fact that the runs were safe in pregnancy, that we had put rid of nevirapine, which is a living nightmare in terms of its complexity and its toxicity and the ethics of giving it to, to, to women. Um, that it was great in TV that we didn't have to have the endless debates about dose escalation of, of efavirenz to 800 milligrams. That, um, that there were multiple fixed dose combinations. That it was relatively cheap. That we could move patients, and certainly in my part of the world, um, across borders where we didn't have to worry about change, changing formulations. And that we had evidence that moving it from you know, if patients did fail efavirenz, that we could move them across to PR-based regimens, and that that transition was very, very highly effective. So that was a wonderful space to be. We found them wonder regimen, and and then I remember having a conversation with the head of S, one of the heavy here at Aspen, one of the big generic companies in South Africa. And he sat me down. He said, "Hey, there's this new drug, Dolitegravir." And I actually remember being wildly annoyed because I was like, "We've put so much effort into efavirenz." Leave me alone. You know, like we've, it's been so hard to get here and we've fought so hard to get rid of D 4 t and to get onto Tsnafavir and to get these fixed dose combinations and to get the price down and to harmonize the regulation and everything. And he said, but it's cheaper. And I was like, yeah, but really, like, you know how much work it was to get you. And anyway, so, but at that stage, the cracks were starting to show in your and they were, the resistance barrier was poor, and we were starting to see the rise of NRTR resistance. We were starting to see breakthrough pregnancies in South Africa because there was this drug interaction with the hormonal contraception. And these nuisance side effects were stopping. They weren't just nuisances. They were real metabolic side effects. Um, the CNS side effects were starting to affect adherence. And sometimes they were actually really serious and even um, causing deaths. And so efavirenz actually was the weak link in all of this. So we started to look more and more at dolutegravir, and this drug started. So I think the first lesson is don't just think you'd found the perfect regimen, that in fact there were improvements coming along the line. The next lesson, and this is something I, I didn't quite appreciate until we started to dust off all the registration studies, that often the registration studies don't show you the real side effects. You have to really use these drugs at scale and you have to use them um, you know, in large codes and in the, in the populations that you, you can use them in at scale. Um, the registration studies sometimes, and the observa small observation studies sometimes exaggerate some side effects and they don't pick up the real ones. And one of the things I was astonished to learn when I went back is that the D4T registration studies did not pick up lipoatrophy in any significant um, numbers. It was really the patients coming forward and complaining about it. The original Gilead studies of Tenofovir, for instance, versus D4T didn't pick up much in the way of lipoatrophy, picked up the peripheral neuropathy. But it was patients coming forward and saying, hey, you know, this stuff is really like messing with me um, that, that picked it up. And the same with AZT, you know, AZT, the bone marrow stuff was picked up, but not really the lipo atrophy, which was quite a late um, side effect. So not of here, um, that everyone's very worried about the, the bone and the renal failure. But actually, when we put it out in the field, the renal failure is, is actually market is really unusual. Um, and finally, with Dolitegravir, all the stuff that we were really worried about, the iris and the drama around insomnia and the psychosis and hepatitis, when we put it out in the field, we saw very, very little of it. So I think what the, the big lesson here for me is when you're going to make major changes in programmatic stuff using drugs, anticipate that you're not going to get what you think you're going to get. And you do need to put pharmacovigilance front and center of what's coming up. And I think the weight gain that we saw with what we, um, what we saw with antiretroviral therapy was something we did not anticipate, I'll get to that in a moment. You also need to program the, you need to do the studies in the population again, get the drugs. And you don't treat women as just a side effect of, you know, of, as a population that you're vaguely going to study after the fact. And I think the, the neural tube defect signal was just the, the, is something we still need to be angry about, is that if you are intending drugs to be used at scale. You need to design your studies and your registration studies with women in mind right from the get-go. And that means using these drugs in women who are going to become pregnant and studying the teratogenicity and studying the biokinetics, you know, the pharmacokinetics and all of those stuff right from the beginning and not treating women as an, as an annoyance that you sort of do it in the phase four part of these things. You start looking at them and I've watched WHO and all these other organizations starting to be much more proactive in terms of issuing guidelines. And I'm really proud of the people who've done that stuff, that have put that, JIS has put out journal articles starting to guide drug companies to start saying, this is how we expect new drugs to be looked at. And I think we are starting to see momentum around that. 
The other thing is that we now know that, you know, sort of started doing the traditional thing, which is going to study these drugs in white middle-class gay men in the North is not going to cut it anymore. And I think we see increasingly people pointing fingers at international conferences and saying, hey, why are you not looking at populations that are actually affected by this? And looking at and these articles, which demonstrate that even by, even if you just confine it to North America and Europe, these studies are not looking at, um, at representative population within the, even within their own countries, let alone for the global um, HIV epidemic. And I think, again, um, these registration studies need to be more, um, it just, just needs to be more representative. It's actually not that hard. And I think that there does seem, again, to be more, more movement in this area um, and companies starting to, 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 at least on paper, commit themselves to doing that. And I think that we need to make our peace with the fact that TLD is actually so good that the next generation of better drugs are not likely to be oral, or they're likely to be oral drugs which are you know, weekly or monthly at, um, and likely to be injectable, implantable. And this TLD is so good, in, both in terms of its tolerability and side effect profile, as well as in terms of its resistance barrier, that it's, it's difficult to imagine, unless some new side effect suddenly declares itself, that it's going to be improved upon. And these new in injections and these new implantables are coming along. Um, it's the root of administration that seems to be a, is going to be a, is going to be addressed, not the side effect profile. And I think that we need to understand that the rise of this is what's going to change things. And that in many ways, what this is going to pose is not around um, yeah, the cost is one thing, but the biggest challenge around this stuff is the huge operational challenges this poses. That actually, it's not a big benefit. Uh, I think people just left that everyone, patients do want this. They want, and in many ways, I think patients have leapfrogged across clinicians in terms of wanting this stuff. But when patients come every six months to pick up their tablets and then realize they have to come three times in six months to come and get the injections to the clinic, that might actually be a significant impediment. And trying to find safe injection sites and places where they can get them, um, you know, where cold chains potentially have to be maintained and where patients have to be registered um, is an operational challenge we're going to have to think very carefully about going forward. My next lesson is obviously the thing I'd be involved in is that weight gain is inevitable. And I, I think this is a big lesson for all of us is that it looks to me that I don't think the integrase inhibitors are implicated. Or I might be wrong, but I'm pretty certain that that we can see weight gain on all modern antiretroviral and significant weight gain, especially amongst black women. And if this is the case, it has huge implications for drug development. And it means that we are going to have to start paying attention to lifestyle interventions um, right from the get-go when we initiate antiretroviral therapy and not continually be worrying about which antiretroviral regimen is causing weight gain, anticipating that all of them are going to be associated with, with weight gain. I'll come back to that in a moment. And I think the last lesson is that the next breakthroughs may not be antiretrovirals. And that's um, antiretrovirals, I mean, I'll say this softly, is that with oral antiretrovirals, TLD might be as good as it gets, or that the tweaks are going to be very, very small. And the next thing is that we, it's like, what do my patients need? And I think I tell you, what we're working on at the moment is we may need obesity drugs. We may need lifestyle interventions that are affordable and that are actually appropriate, that you know that people can actually use in Africa. Um, we may need proper diabetes care. We may need non-communicable diseases screening that's appropriate. And we need to keep an eye on the cure agenda. You know, if something crops up that is difficult to do, that is very expensive, can we implement it? And this is the stuff that I think is going to be challenging us as HIV clinicians in the field going forward. Um, it may not be the next tenofovir, the next you know, replacement for D4T, the next replacement for efavirenz. It might be something that is actually a whole lot more complicated. Um, and the next, I think the next big, th big thing is going to be the injectables. But after that, we really need to keep our eye on the ball that this is the next breakthrough that might come. So in conclusion, um, I think dollar takeover has really revolutionized things, but it's also sobered us that the next step is not, we're going to be splitting hairs um, around oral antiretroviral breakthroughs. Um, that the other stuff is actually where we need to be focusing our energy and our creativity. The new era is the long actings, but beyond that is going to be um, where are we going to cite these long actings? How are we going to make it happen? 
it's not as simple as just simply you know putting the long actings next to the, the orals in the in the clinic um and those breakthroughs those things that obesity care in particular i think is a huge challenge for us um certainly in my clinic we have nothing to offer our patients you know, telling them to to exercise and and to 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 go on to a healthy diet has done deadly squat for the for the weight gain that we're seeing in with it within the clinic so I think it's really exciting, and I think, but I think the challenges are coming thick and fast. And simply looking for the next new fancy drug is is unfortunately not the easy one that we were hoping it was going to be. And I think for all of us, certainly those of us in Africa, um, we're going to have to look look hard and look deep for those challenges that are coming. Thank you very much.